Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Noel McCarty. I'm the Associate Dean of the Woodrow Wilson School. I'd like to welcome you here to our panel, Up to the Minute, Crisis in Haiti, the Economic Health and Stabilization Ramifications. As we all know, the recent earthquake in Haiti has led to one of the greatest uh, humanitarian problems uh, in recent uh, history. Uh, the ramifications both for Haiti, its citizens, but also uh, for the rest of the world are quite tremendous. Uh, so we're quite fortunate this afternoon to have a panel uh, that can put uh, all of these developments uh, into context for us. Uh, this is part of our uh, discussion series, Up to the Minute, in which we follow, literally follow uh, world events and crises uh, as they occur. Uh, I'd like to, and I'd also like to mention uh, that a public reception will follow the talk in Schultz Dining Room. Uh, so without further ado, let me uh, introduce our panelists uh, for this afternoon. Uh, to my uh, far right is Audrey Dorillion. Uh, who is pursuing a PhD in demography and public affairs at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton. She is affiliated with our Office of Population Research. Influenced by her childhood in Haiti, her broad research interests are in population, health, and environment interactions. Her current research is on urbanization, health, and climate change. Uh, to my immediate left, we have uh, Dr. Laura Kahn, MD, MPP, uh, and MPH. Uh, who has led a two-year study assessing the public health infrastructure in New Hampshire, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania under a Josiah Macy Foundation grant. From 2003 to 2009, she organized the Carnegie Corporation-sponsored Biodefense Seminar at Princeton University. Before joining our staff, she was a managing physician for the New Jersey Department of Health and Senior Services and a medical officer for the Food and Drug Administration. She is currently a monthly columnist for the online bulletin of Atomic Scientist and has authored Who's in Charge? Leadership During Epidemics. To my immediate right, uh, we have Dean uh, Christina Paxson, who in 2000 founded uh, the, uh, the Woodrow Wilson School Center for Health and Well-Being, which is an interdisciplinary research center uh, here at the school. During her time as director of CHW, the center started undergraduate and graduate certificate programs in health and health policy and took on the leadership of the university's health grand challenges program. She's the senior editor of the Future of Children, a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research Program on Aging, Health, and Children, and a research associate of Princeton's Office of Population Research. Her research concerns health, economic development, and public policy with a current focus on economic status and health outcomes. She has been the principal investigator of several National Institutes of Health funded studies and a founding director of a National Institute of Aging Center for the Economics and Demography of Aging. And finally, uh, to my far left is Robert Perito, who directs the United States Institute of Peace Initiative on Security Sector Governance under the Centers of, Innov under the Centers of Innovation. He was also a senior program officer in the Center for Post-Conflict Peace and Stability Operations, where he directs the Haiti and Peacekeeping Lessons Learned Projects. He came to USIP in 2001 as a senior fellow in the Jennings Randolph Fellowship Program. Before joining the Institute, he was a Foreign <coughs> Service Officer at the Department of State, uh, retiring at the rank of Minister Counselor. Perito received a Presidential Meritorious Service Award in 1990 for leading the U.S. delegation to the Angola Peace Talks and has served as Deputy Director of the International Criminal Investigative Training Assistance Program at the United States Department of Justice, which trains police in international peace operations. So with that, let me turn it over to our first panelist, Audrey. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming. Um, as um, I was introduced, I'm a third-year doctoral student at Princeton. Um, pursuing a PhD in demography and public affairs. Um, but I was actually born in Haiti um, and spent the first part of my childhood there um, and actually left in 1991 in November, a month after um, there was a coup d'etat that had ousted President Alistair. Um, but before, I like, I actually, you know, the last time that I was in Haiti was last April and it was actually for my grandfather's 100th birthday. 
And I didn't think that, and I had planned on actually returning um, either in April again or this summer, but not really under these circumstances. Um, so as you may realize, um, I do have relatives in Port-au-Prince, especially in the regions of Delma, Pétionville, Corfu, um, and also outside of Port-au-Prince in Lecaille, Jacques Mel, and La Vallée de Jacques Mel. But I was actually very fortunate, um, and all of my immediate family, we learned, um, were fine. Um, although, for instance, my father's brother um, actually lost his house. But even though my immediate family has been fine, um, it's still like everyone, you know, the, every, there's not a single Haitian I know who doesn't know someone who was lost. And I think just like recently, yesterday I was reading an article in the New York Times um, about some of the rescue efforts in the Hotel Montana. And they mentioned um, someone's name, um, Sarah Lochio, and I was like, that name seems very familiar. And actually, you know, knew her, um, like, we, you know, she had gone to the same school and was actually from the, my cousin's neighborhood in Delma. Um, so, but before I actually begin, I just wanted to reinstate that, like, I'm here to kind of give more of the human perspective, and I'm not, by far, not an expert on Haitian history, but I am going to... Um, give some key highlights of Haitian history and also, um, I guess, kind of culture and as a demographer, some of the demographic facts that kind of um, illustrate why, you know, it was particularly so vulnerable. Okay. So um, I'm actually going to begin um, with just, you know, 1791 with the, I guess, the start of the revolutionary period in Haiti. So the, from 1791 until 1804 um, was the battle for independence. And I guess unlike the US, it was never like clear in terms of the sides. Um, there were many different factions. Um, there were the, you know, the slaves, the maroons, which were free, um, which were slaves that had escaped. And then there were the white planters, and then there were the free people of color. And then there were also um, the um, pretty blanc which were whites, but they weren't necessarily um, property holders. So during this period, um, I'm not gonna go into much details, but like our war for independence didn't just start, wasn't, didn't actually start as a slave revolt. The first battle actually started with the free people of color actually fight, fighting to try to gain um, more um, rights um, and stuff like that. But then eventually it did end up being a you know, slave revolt and in 1804, um, Jean Jacques Dessalines declared independence. And one of the defining battles was actually in November of um, 1803. And I actually have a great, 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 I don't know how many great grandfather that actually fought in that battle, but um, yeah. <laughs> so since 1804, um, there's, I, I guess like I always joke that in Haiti it's so hard to keep the, to actually know the whole succession of all the leaders just because you know there have been so many and there has been very little long periods of um, just stability um, but I guess I'm just going to kind of skip a bit of time and just focus on nine in this century like starting with 1915 so actually in nine, from 1915 to 1934 um, the Haiti was actually occupied by the US I'm not exactly sure as to why, but there was um, some concern of some growing um, German influence. And then also there had been a bloody revolt um, in 1915 in which the then president had actually been killed, but that was kind of in retaliation for him, I think, murdering about like 167 political prisoners that were actually coming from the, um, um, the elite families. But during the U.S. occupation, um, almost all of the leaders in Haiti had actually been from prominent mulatto families. So after the U.S. occupation in 1934, that kind of, there was kind of a reversal. And that's when, like, for example, Papa Doc in 1957, when he was elected president, he was elected, like his platform was very different. It was just like embracing the black, the African roots, um, voodoo, um, and all that stuff. So, my, so Papa Doc wrote from 1957 until 1971 his de um, during, uh, until his death. And that's actually the time period in which my parents um, grew up in Haiti. And, and it, it was one of the most um, brutal regimes just because my mom actually uh, tells these stories that like, you know, no one was allowed to meet in groups. Um, like if you ever had, like, I forgot what, you know, a group of more than a certain number of students 
you know, you, you, you know, you could fear for your life. And it was like he did not tolerate, like, and it was like he had the secret police, um, the Tonton Mahout, but also like it was, I, I'm not sure, I wouldn't say it was a stability because um, it was, I guess, somewhat stable, but then it was at a high cost of human rights. Um, and yeah, and then even um, one of my um, great uncles actually was killed um, during that time. So Papa Doc was in Haiti from 1957 to 1971. In 1971, he passed away and his son actually became president at just at the age of 19. Um, so his son was actually president until 1986. So I was actually, my parents were, grew up under Papa Doc and actually grew, um, was born under Baby Doc. Um, but in 1986, um, he was ousted. And then once again, began the wave of a lot of turnovers. I think, I'm not sure even if I can th think of how many leaders we've had between 86 and you know, even now, there's been so many um, frequent turnovers. But in 1991, there were the democratically elected, you know, there was a democratic election, and Jean Bertrand Aristide was um, elected president. But unfortunately, you know, but in, you know, just as in the past, I guess, in 1991, he was ousted um, by the military um, coup. And yeah, in 1994, he was actually reinstated. The, um, the US actually came back into Haiti. Um, but he was, there was an interim government, and then in 96, actually, um, 1996, um, Préval, um, which was part of his political party, was elected president, and then Alice actually re-ran in 2000. And in Haiti, you can be president twice, but you can't serve two consecutive terms. So that's why there's kind of been the back and forth. But the 2000 elections were actually highly contested, and a lot of the opposition um, did not vote. Um, so, but, uh, but I said it was, you know, from 2000, but then in 2004, um, there were, you know, that, that's when there were actually increasingly student protests. Um, just because I guess, I mean, this is gonna be my personal point of view. Um, I said was a democratically elected in 1991 and he did have the people's support, but when he came back, I think, unfortunately, the very things that he stood for and he had promised, you know, he, didn't del you know really deliver and during his um, dr during his presidency, especially um, in the 2000s, there were increasingly um, like you heard a lot of human rights violation, um, increasing drug trafficking, um, and personally and just a lot of um, I guess retaliate. You know, like he had disbanded the military, and instead um, there was a kind of a civilian police force, and then also the Shimer, the street gangs, and. It was a really unstable time. So during that period, I actually didn't, my family didn't feel safe for us um, to travel to Haiti often. And in fact, um, the house that I grew in uh, and my next door neighbors, at one point, you know, police came, so, you know, took everyone, broad daylight, you know, pointed guns at them, everything, questioned them, you know, for the, you know, uh, my cousin, like he was held for like two days and then released him. And then he was like, what were the charges? Oh, there were no charges. You know, but you know, there you know, you, you weren't if you weren't with La Balas, it was um, actually very hard. And and then, so in two thousand four, there was the once again he was ousted. Um, and there's been some contention of whether or not the U.S. Um, helped the rebel forces. That I don't know. Um, but the rebel forces were a lot of the ex-military leaders that you know from the military he had disbanded, and they mostly came through the Dominican Republic. And you know, and you know, eventually marched towards the capital. Um, and then after that, there was an interim government, and then Préval uh, was once again elected. But he, this time, it was by a slim majority. I think just fifty-one percent. And that's kind of where we are now. Um, but yeah, so I, I guess that's kind of, of a brief sketch of um, Haitian uh, of some of the turnover. As I said, like I'm not an expert on Haitian. You know history, but I can just give um, some of my take on it. Um, yeah, but increasingly, though, um, I do think that stuff in Haiti was getting a little bit better. Once again, um, when my family left Haiti in 1991, um, we actually didn't realize that we were going to be, you know, permanently gone. My parents had actually just happened to obtain the visa at the, you know, during that time. So we actually planned on just being gone for a year. 
and then returning. And my parents had actually reinstated us in our school. But then since the situation didn't look to be getting better, they decided to stay. But during that time, my parents were in a sense had started building a new house because we actually, I grew up in Kofu. And if you see from the news, Kofu, you know, it's just gone downhill, you know, every year it's gone downhill. And even when I was living in Haiti, it was actually pressure to move out. And we had to move to Del Mar while waiting to build a house um, near Petronville. But for instance, that property, when we left, we found out that um, during um, the, the La Valas party rain, that it was actually appropriated. And we found out that someone started building on it. And you couldn't do anything because it was actually a cabinet member of our seat. So it's not until like recently this year that I guess you could see that maybe there was some sense of you know justice and the courts were actually somewhat functioning because it was this year, however many years later, that we actually found out that that property you know was legally recognized as my parents and that you know indeed the, the cabinet, former cabinet member that had built did have to actually pay something. So. I guess the sensation that many Haitians felt was that stuff were beginning to turn around. Um, just this year, um, the Oasis of the Sea, I guess one of the biggest ships, had actually you know, um, docked at La Badie, which is a big tourist destination. And we Haitians always joke that before they did tell um, cruise, um, cruise, um, the cr people on the cruise ships that they were going to Haiti, they said, oh, they're going to Hispaniola, you know, the name of the whole <laughs> island. But now they're actually, you know, saying Haiti. Um, and also in Pétionville, um, there was a big, um, I'm not sure if it was a resort that was starting to be built. And then Bill Clinton had been to Haiti and had actually said that, like, stuff was turning around. And I think this year was not supposed to be our first year of actually, you know, strong growth um, in many years. So that's why I guess all of this, you know, it came at, you know, one of the worst times because it did seem that like stuff were actually starting to turn back around. Like I was planning on going back to Haiti this summer. My dad was actually spending more time in the country. He's doing a community service project um, in La Vallée de Jacmel and then for this to happen. So um, yeah, and I think my time is almost up, but I just want to kind of state just some demographic facts about Haiti. <coughs> Um, most of you guys may know now that Haiti has a population of about 9 million people. Um, about 3 million outside, you know, in the port au and the port au um, surrounding region. But the Haitian population is extremely young. 38% um, of the population is under 15, and close to 50% of the population is under 20. I think the median age is like 20.2. So we have a very young population, and that's one of the reasons why when you see the news coverage, you're like, why so many children? Um, so it's just kind of the, you know, the demographics of it. And I guess you have this young population and also like Port-au-Prince um, grew very rapidly. Like I think in the newspapers, they said that like Port-au-Prince was originally designed to be a city, you know, for 50,000, but now you have like over um, 2 million people in the surrounding areas. But I would just want to say one of the reasons why there's been so much rural urban migration, as well as you know we have a high rate of natural increase, um, is just because of the you know poor economic situation of the country. Um, and I guess that's where why sometimes people are a little nervous about American intervention because in the past, Amer you know, as with the occupation, Americans have intervened, but it hasn't always had the best outcomes. Um, in the 80s, there was a case of um, swine fever in the Dominican Republic. Um, and I think there were a few you know, pigs that were infected, but it wasn't in Haiti. But the US um, DA you know, recommended that they actually cull all of the Creole pigs um, in Haiti. So you know, the Haitian government you know, complied, and you know, the Haitian Creole pig was culled. But the, the pigs were actually like a you know, form of livelihood, for, you know, especially for subsistence farmers. You didn't have to do anything. Like you know, there were natural garbage, to, um, the, you know, compost, like anything organic waste they ate. But the U.S. replaced that with like you know, nice pink, I guess, American, you know, the pigs. But the the pigs that the U.S. did provided needed a cement floor and clear water, something that a lot of the population itself doesn't have. So clearly, that effort, you know did not work and you know the Creole pig from other islands had once again to be reintroduced. So that's just like one example of um, you know I guess sometimes US intervention that hasn't really um, been helpful. And I'm just gonna give one other example. 
um, the Haiti in, ter with, um, in terms of the IMF, um, we've had to, uh, we've had to um, remove some of our tariffs. And one of the tariffs that they removed was on uh, rice. In, 1990, in 1980, um, Haiti was 80% self-sufficient in rice. Now, you know, that's not so. And I think like a lot of Haitians, we feel like, that, you know, that's such, you know, at least we feel a lot of, not anger, I'm not sure anger when we realize that the U.S. itself, you know, heavily subsidizes its own uh, rice industries. So it's not as if it's under perfect um, competition either that, you know, the U.S. is able to produce it at cheaper prices. Um, than Haiti, but because of that, that actually devastated the Altiboni region, which is why a lot, you know, kind of like um, once again pulled more people to migrate um, to Port-au-Prince. So once again, the bidonville, the in Port-au-Prince, as you see, it's you know there's the water, you know, a low flat area, and then everything goes up. And as the name of our country, it's IET, which means mountainous land, um, and there's, the hills are very steep. And actually, for zoning laws, you're not supposed to build there. But you know, people build anyway. So once again, that quick um, urbanization without the proper zoning laws, without the proper infrastructure, um, you know, in those steep um, hill, um, hills and you know, mountainsides, all I guess added to the vulnerability um, that we, you saw, and the fact that like some of the houses just pancaked, you know, right on top of each other. So I guess you know, I kind of give you guys a, you know a few fragments here and there, but that's just some of the you know things that like I as a Haitian and other Haitians, um, you know, you get a little feel for like some of the background that we come with. Okay, thank you. Well, first I'd like to um, thank Patty Yelovich for organizing this panel and for inviting me to talk and thank you all for your interest. I think I'm the only one who has PowerPoint. Um, before I start, I just want to emphasize that um, this crisis that happened in Haiti is not only a public health crisis, a humanitarian crisis, it's also a political crisis. And as Audrey pointed out in, in her eloquent speech uh, before me, um, Haiti's had a very long history of political instability, problems both internal and external, and of any country in the Western Hemisphere, if not perhaps the world, that could not handle a crisis of this magnitude, it would be Haiti. Um, so I'm going to talk about a number of things. First off, I want to talk about Haiti's baseline capabilities. Now, it has a number of uh, structures, health posts, health centers, um, hospitals that are nationwide as well as in Port-au-Prince. But uh, beyond looking at just the structures, you have to look at what goes on inside those structures and what are they actually doing. And I was very interested um, to compare Haiti with the Dominican Republic. It's the same island. Uh, they have basically the same size population, but Haiti's had this long string of political instability. Now, I have to admit, I don't really know what the Dominican Republic's history has been, but when you look at some of the health statistics, it's really quite striking. So here they are, the same island, same size population, but in Haiti, the probability of dying if you're five years or under is 80 per thousand life births. And in the Dominican Republic, it's 29 per thousand life births. Um, Haiti spends about $96 per capita, $2,006, uh, versus the Dominican Republic, which spends almost uh, $450 per capita. But what's most, um, uh, most concerning is that Haiti has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the world. Um, according to World 2008 World Health Organization UNICEF statistics, um, its vaccination rates about 53 percent versus the Dominican <coughs> Republic, which rates is about 80 to 96 percent. And I just want to explain a little bit about the concept of herd immunity and why this is so important. So no vaccine is 100 percent effective. And so in order to try to prevent spread of uh, communicable diseases, you need to vaccinate a certain percentage of your population. And for most vaccine preventable diseases, um, you have to vaccinate at the minimum 75 to 94 percent of your population to prevent the spread of, of these diseases. And it depends on the disease, it depends on the vaccine, and it depends on the underlying health of the population. So you can see that by no stretch of the imagination is Haiti meeting its population needs. And, um, and its children, uh, 
are, are vulnerable to getting uh, these vaccine preventable diseases. In terms of life expectancy, it's about 61 years, although uh, Audrey's grandfather uh, certainly exceeded that. It's um, that whole town. <laughs> um, it has some of the highest infant mortality rates uh, under age five in the Western Hemisphere. Maternal mortality rates are, are the highest in, in the Western Hemisphere. A sizable fraction of its people are living with HIV AIDS and 60% um, of the people lack basic health services. Um, and and um, UNICEF and other international organizations have been trying to make a dent in these statistics, but what's really needed is strong leadership, uh, security, a functioning government, um, and a commitment to investing in its people, which so far Haiti's not been doing. Now the current situation, the earthquake damaged or destroyed at least eight hospitals around Port-au-Prince and the remaining facilities have been overwhelmed, although money can function with the help of um, NGOs. But the number of dead is believed to be in the hundreds of thousands, and the number of injured or homeless in the hundreds and thousands. Media sources report that there are now cases of diarrhea, malaria, meningitis, measles, and tetanus. Measles and tetanus are, of course, vaccine preventable. And UNICEF, UNICEF does plan to vaccinate about 100, 600,000 children under age five, but aid personnel are warning that supplies are dangerously scarce. There are shortages of analgesic and medications for amputations, and there's been tens of thousands of amputations as a result of this earthquake. Now, I can't stress to you enough how important political leadership is in a crisis of this magnitude. And nothing tests a political leader like a, like a disaster like this. And unfortunately, um, President uh, René Preval has not risen to the occasion. He's been uh, a rather absent leader. He's not rallied his people, inspired them. Um, and in fact, uh, according to one media report, Reuters on January 24th, it stated that as he left Archbishop Milo's funeral, he was mobbed by people who were angry about the slow delivery of the service of aid, and some shouted at him to quit. Now, in terms of basic public health needs, um, of course, the primary need is clean <coughs> water. Um, and I've not been to Haiti, but I would imagine since it's in the Caribbean that it's got a rather hot and humid climate. Is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Hot and humid. And so you need adequate hydration, even in the best of circumstances. And people can survive for a number of days without food, but you can't survive very long without water. And in particular, um, if young children, the elderly, pregnant women, and nursing women have less reserve uh, to survive without clean water than others. So this is your number one priority in this type of crisis. In addition, there's sanitation and hygiene um, one of the most basic government services is waste removal and sanitation. And indeed, this goes all the way back to the Roman times when the Romans recognized that uh, they need clean water and they built all these aqueducts to bring in water and to remove waste. Now, unfortunately, they had their pipes lined with lead, but they did recognize that um, clean water was important for health. So one of the signs of government failure is outbreaks of cholera. Um, and again, some of the people here are developing diarrhea. Um, cholera is a bacterial disease that's transmitted from water contaminated with sewage. Um, and cases of severe diarrhea can lead to dehydration and rapid death if not treated. So Haiti is at risk for a cholera epidemic uh, if there is not adequate clean water and sanitation. Other diseases that signal poor sanitation include typhoid, hepatitis, and other gastroenteritis. Food and shelter is another basic need, and it's reported that up to 1.5 million Haitians have lost their homes. Now, I want to say before I get to my next slide that I have some pretty graphic pictures, so if anybody gets disturbed by these, I'm warning you now to avert your eyes. But I think it is important to understand what you're dealing with when you have a massive earthquake and lots of crushed injuries. 
I, I want to emphasize that dead bodies rarely spread disease and that earthquakes rarely trigger major epidemics, but you do need to bury your dead and you, uh, because the, the smell of decay is overwhelming and you certainly don't want dead bodies contaminating your water supply. Now, crush injuries are among the major concerns with earthquake victims. Uh, they need to be uh, surgically treated, frequently amputated. Uh, but in addition, the victims need to get massive amounts of intravenous fluids because what happens is when the tissues get crushed, they release massive amounts of the intracellular components uh, into the bloodstream, uh, sludging the bloodstream up and going to the kidneys. Uh, the kidneys are one of your major filtering systems. And if they get sludged up from all the materials that are released, then they go into failure. So even if you do manage to amputate the limb and you're able to remove the damaged, uh, damaged uh, part of the body, the person can still die because of overwhelming kidney failure and they can also die from uh, wound infection. Uh, so you need to have uh, enough antibiotics. People are gonna be inhaling dust from collapsed concrete and all of this requires intensive care. And from what I've been reading, there's an acute shortage of nurses Lots of doctors have rushed to, uh, international doctors have, have rushed, but um, unfortunately, not enough nurses. And that might be a, uh, a demographic effect, or a lack of ability for nurses to leave their positions. In terms of uh, health relief efforts, um, there have been uh, efforts by many countries to, to aid Haiti. Um, United Nations agencies, non-governmental organizations, and one of the keys for all of this is, of course, coordination and leadership. Uh, and one of the complaints that I had been reading about is that it seemed to be rather disorganized and scattered, and everybody kept asking who's in charge. Uh, so you really need to have, uh, again, uh, governmental leadership. In this case, the government was literally crushed. Uh, the leader is absent and weak. So they had um, a lot of uh, an overwhelming situation. And finally, in terms of rebuilding, I'm just going to briefly mention this because I know the subsequent speakers will be going into this in more detail, but you need to have a functioning government. Haiti has not had a, a good track record in its history of having strong political leadership that wants to invest in its people. Rather, they've tried to extract all of Haiti's resources for their own, for their own benefit. Um, you need to have adequate security, economic development, infrastructure replacement, education, qualified health personnel. Um, and this is going to take a very, very long time, perhaps decades. And with a very short attention span by the media, it's not clear if Hedy will get the attention it will deserve over the long term when the next crisis, which will certainly occur, uh, will distract the, uh, the media and uh, world attention uh, and move it away from Haiti. So thank you very much. Hi, thanks. Thanks for all of you for coming. I, I wanted to talk about two things. One very briefly. I think there, there are two reasons why I'm on this panel. I am not a Haiti expert. Um, I have done some work on the health effects of disasters, specifically about Hurricane Katrina. And I'll talk a little bit about that and sort of what trying to extrapolate what it means for Haiti. And also, I'm a development economist, and I think it's good to sort of go back to some development basics and think about what this country needs in order to get back onto the kind of growth track that Audrey suggested it was on, ironically, uh, before this earthquake took place. So let me tell you a little bit about mental health post-disasters. Uh, I've been for the last three, four years, uh, five years now since um, the hurricane, tracking a group of people who were in New Orleans, low-income families uh, prior to the hurricane, and we've been sort of following them as they've moved around the country, and looking at what happened to their mental health and their health outcomes over time. And, you know, even for this group, we've seen uh, really pronounced effects. They're doubling in rates of depression, uh, about 30% of the people who are in our study uh, about a year and a half after the hurricane had severe symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, there are big differences between Katrina and, and this event now. And 
One, and I think the most important thing is that while people from New Orleans suffered a lot, they did not suffer prolonged deprivation. They weren't, you know, still three, four weeks after the event um, needing food and water. So, and that deprivation is related to the effects that come later, the extent of the deprivation. And the other thing that I think is very important is that people from New Orleans could leave, right? There were places to go that were stable and safe and that had food and water and housing. And even though these places weren't always wonderful, they were there. And so when you look at Haiti right now, you see a very different situation where you have prolonged deprivation and you really see, you know, people can go out to the country, but still I think it, it's a very small country and um, I think we can expect the effects to be uh, substantially worse than what we've seen um, post Katrina. So that's one piece of, I think, bad news. I, I should stress though that while these mental health effects are bad, when we look at people from who went through Katrina, you also see incredible resilience among individuals. And while there's a lot of mental health problems and also physical health problems, the majority of people actually recover pretty well. And it, so it's kind of astonishing to see just how, how well people can put themselves back together and keep going. Um, it's quite impressive. So let me turn to economic development, and it's funny, I didn't talk to Laura before this presentation, but I had also written down some statistics comparing Haiti to the Dominican Republic. Because I, and of course, I focused on economic statistics, not health statistics, but I, the, the comparison is very instructive. You know, you have two countries, they're together on the same island, they have comparable resources, natural resources, or at least they did at one time. Um, the gross national income per capita in the Dominican Republic is seven times that of Haiti, or it was prior to the earthquake. So quite a big um, uh, difference. Uh, Haiti uh, has more people living in rural areas, larger fraction of the population, or did. Uh, a larger fraction of its gross domestic product comes from agriculture, but I want to come back to that, there's a difference. Exports are much lower in Haiti than in DR. Only 14% of GDP is exported. Uh, and official development assistance is much higher. There was one statistic that came out of the World Development Indicators that I thought was really interesting, and it's something that also I want to come back to. I don't know where, these get, that, where they get these numbers, but they make good factoids. And even if they're right within an order of magnitude, they're still interesting. They have a statistic on the number of days it takes to start a business. And the number of days for the Dominican Republic is 19, and the number of days for Haiti is 195. So, I, you know, I think when you look at these statistics, you get a sense of an economy where, you know, even before the earthquake, it was functioning really badly. Um, most of the agriculture is not for export, it's subsistence farming. Um, roads are bad, electrical services are bad. The kind of things that you need to really develop a thriving export industry are not there, we're not there. Um, whereas if you look at DR, you see um, agriculture for export, coffee, sugar, tobacco, some tourism, some manufacturing, things like that. Uh, one bright spot in Haiti just prior to the earthquake is that through an act called the HOPE Act, H-O-P-E, I, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but Haiti has tariff-free access to the U.S. Um, they had set up a couple export processing zones, one in Port-au-Prince and one in a town along the border of the Dominican Republic, uh, and were really starting a fledgling export garment um, sector, which was bringing in some income, and that was a bright spot. So, so let's get to some of the development challenges after an earthquake like this. And where I come in is not in the immediate sort of, you know, what do we do to stabilize in the immediate aftermath of a, of a disaster. I'm thinking more about where this country should go over the next year or two or three or five, um, a slightly longer term developing, development strategy. And I think the most important thing is that it, as soon as possible, the country needs to return to a coordinated development plan, which actually had been put in place and was being followed before the earthquake struck. Um, it will need a concerted and very strategic uh, roadmap for thinking about how to invest the money that's going to be flowing into the country for some time. And I, I think it's important, th this may be, I, I don't know, a subtle point, but it, it's important at some point to stop thinking about the money going to Haiti as charity and start to think about it as development investment. 
and getting that transition going is probably a good thing. So let me talk about some of the elements that uh, I think would be good to put into a plan like this. It's funny, after I sort of wrote down my notes, I did some reading on um, Paul Collier, who's a, who's a prominent development economist, who's also been doing some writing on Haiti. And we came up with very similar points, which made me feel good. Uh, so there's at least some consistency across two uh, random economists. Uh, one is that I think it's important not to focus just on Port-au-Prince um, during the development. And I think it's very tempting after a disaster to say, well, we have to go back and fix what's broken, right? We have to restore what was there. And the truth is, when you look at Haiti, I think the setup before the earthquake was not ideal. Port-au-Prince was probably too big. Um, the country would be better off with a more productive rural and agricultural sector. It would be better off with more vibrant, mid-sized cities through which agricultural products are being rooted on their way to ports. Um, so, you know, investments outside of Port-au-Prince were probably really wise before the earthquake, and I think they probably still are after the earthquake. That doesn't mean there's not a lot to do in that one city, but I think the rest of the country should not be ignored. <coughs> if only because a lot of people from Port-au-Prince will be heading out to outlying areas. Okay. The other thing that makes a lot of sense right now is to start a massive public works program that focuses on the development of public, uh, productive infrastructure. So even before the earthquake, what Haiti needed in terms of productive infrastructure, um, in addition to hospitals and schools and, and health centers, were things like road construction, road repaving, um, rural electrific electrification, and even in urban cities, I think the electric uh, uh, supply in, in Port-au-Prince was very um, uncertain, um, port repair. So these were investments that needed to take place before the earthquake. They certainly need to take place after the earthquake. And one of the best strategies is to try to do this through a public works program where you can pay people who are in desperate need of jobs and in desperate need of having a regular occupation to rebuild their lives to actually start to do some of these investments. So that seems like a good idea. Um, the, the third element, I think, is to try to encourage the inflow of private capital. And again, some of this was starting uh, before the earthquake through these new export processing zones that were producing um, garments. It would be really great to try to focus on getting those up and running again um, as quickly as possible and probably extending them to other areas of the country because they seem to be successful. Now, you know, when you look at a, a problem of this magnitude, I think it's, it's, it's kind of easy to say, well, this is what they should do. The, the devil is, in the details of actually implementing plans. So there's some things that really worry me, you know, when I think about how can we actually figure out how to accomplish this. One, I think, is the issue of trying to coordinate the aid funds that will be flowing into the country, both um, from NGOs and private donations and governments from around the, around the world. Um, my fear is that without a coordinated effort, a lot of these funds will be spent in well-intentioned ways that really don't have a lasting impact on the country. Uh, the Clinton-Bush effort, um, when you read on their webpage what they're doing, they say that they're going to redirect the money that they take into reputable NGOs. Well, that's fine, but that's not a development plan. And you know, you worry that, uh, you know, just thinking that, oh, we should give a little bit to lots of different organizations really isn't going to do the country much good in the long run. So that, that's one thing that I worry about. The other thing that has been touched on already, and I don't have a good answer for this, is it, I think it's vitally important to establish a very major role for the Haitian government within whatever plan is put together. Um, if only because we want the plans that are put in place to persist over the long run, you need to have local ownership. Uh, and I think also, as Audrey has uh, referred to, there's a legacy of mistrust of outsiders. And so developing a partnership between um, the government and Haiti and outside organizations where Haiti really does have a legal uh, will be important. <clears throat> the last thing that I want to mention, actually one more after this, but I'm almost done, is that there's a huge scarcity of human capital in the country. And that was true before the earthquake. Uh, a lot of people who are well-educated have left. Um, 
many people who are well educated are working in the civil service. The civil service has been flattened and the government uh, buildings in which they work have been destroyed. So, you know, my guess is that the Haitian uh, uh, diaspora is going to be important for trying to rebuild the country through remittances. And I expect that a lot of the house rebuilding and things like that will really benefit from re remittances from Haitians living in the U.S. and Canada and elsewhere. But it would be good to think of some way to get the expertise and, and the skills embodied in the Haitians who are um, outside of the country and to get those and bring them to bear on the problems that the country is facing. There was a New York Times editorial that recently advocated uh, giving paid leaves to Haitians who go to work on reconstruction projects. I don't know if that's realistic, but it seemed like at least an idea for trying to get the human capital that the country needs back into place. I wanted to uh, end on a, uh, maybe a side note, but it's something that I, I sort of feel strongly about. Often after uh, problems, uh, disasters like this, I think a lot of people have an impulse to go to the country <coughs> to do good. You know, we, we think of it as sort of disaster tourism or uh, that's, that's the, a not very nice way to refer to it. We saw a lot of this after Katrina where people wanted to go and they wanted to help rebuild houses and things like that. And this comes out of the best of motives. Well, you know, this is another case, though, where Haiti is very different from Katrina. Um, after Hurricane Katrina, there actually was a pretty severe shortage of manual labor in the city of New Orleans. So people could come in and they could actually provide something that was scarce, right? Right now, what Haiti has is lots of unskilled labor without work to do. And you know, to sort of spend $1,000 to fly down to Haiti to do manual labor for two weeks is going to benefit Continental Airlines more than it's going to benefit anybody else. So, uh, you know, and I guess if, the, if there are people in there who are thinking about doing this kind of thing, my advice would be, you know, save your money, put it towards things that will actually put Haitians to work rebuilding Haiti, and they'll be doing something that's much better um, for the country in the long run. So, that's it. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Bob Perito. Um, I work at the United States Institute of Peace in Washington, D.C. Um, some of you may not have heard of the United States Institute of Peace. It's a congressionally funded um, institute dedicated to the peaceful resolution of international conflict. Um, I run the uh, Haiti program there and uh, been working on Haiti on and off since 1994. What I'd like to do as the last speaker here is to kind of fill in the blanks and provide some context from, uh, for other things that you've heard from the other speaker and try to give you an understanding of uh, perhaps a Washington uh, and a Haitian perspective on this. Um, I'd like to start my uh, history in September 2008. In September 2008, Haiti was hit by four tropical storms in a row. They lined up and one after the other hit the island. When that was over, Haiti had suffered a loss of some 15% of its gross domestic product. 800 Haitians were dead. Hundreds of thousands had been displaced. The second largest and most important city in the country was under mud. Um, the UN then did its usual thing, which was to appeal for uh, international donations to repair the damage. And no one donated. Uh, less than, I think, $20 million out of $100 million requested actually showed up. And so um, the um, Secretary General of the United Nations convened a staff in New York and he said, we have to do something different. The Band-Aid won't work this time. We have to come up with a new approach. We need a game changer. And actually, they looked to the tsunami uh, in that experience in, uh, in 2004. And what they came up with was celebrity. What we have to do is get a lot of famous people involved and draw a lot of new attention to Haiti and use celebrity to rekindle both the international interest in Haiti and the, uh, you know, the, the will of the Haitian people. And so the first thing they did is they hired Paul Collier. <coughs> Paul Collier is an Oxford economist. He has a best-selling book called The Bottom Billion. Uh, ban Ki-moon sent him to Haiti to do a study. 
uh, of what would be required to get Haiti not only moving again, but to a point where it would obtain uh, economic security. Paul Collier came back with his report, and then uh, Ban Ki-moon, Bill Clinton, who'd been uh, named as the new UN envoy for Haiti, uh, a rock star named Wycliffe Jean, uh, most of us here are at a point in our lives where we probably don't recognize that name, but anybody who's under 20, you know, knows that Wycliffe Jean is both Haitian and a major rock star. Uh, all of them loaded on a plane, they went to Haiti, <coughs> and they got tremendous international attention. That visit was followed by a visit from the entire UN Security Council, and then Secretary Clinton went, and then a whole series of other international figures went to Haiti. And all of that built up to an international donors conference, which convened in Washington in April of 2009. I went to that conference, it was very impressive. On the stage, Shen standing literally shoulder to shoulder, were the president of the World Bank, the president of the International Monetary Fund, the president of the International Development Bank, uh, the head of the Organization of American States, Secretary of State of the United States, Foreign Minister of Canada, uh, and of course President Clinton, the Secretary General of the United Nations, all standing there looking at it, an audience uh, made up of donor countries and non-governmental organizations and saying, okay, two things. One, as President Clinton said in a very emotional speech he gave, and he talked about how he and Hillary had spent their honeymoon in Haiti in 72, and they said, this is Haiti's last best chance in my lifetime. And all of these people stood on the stage and they said, okay, this is it. Two things, one, we're going to give again, we're gonna do this differently, we're going to go in, we're gonna stay the course, but we also expect the Haitians to stand up and assume their responsibilities and work with us. And surprisingly enough, it worked. Uh, over the coming summer, uh, some $70 million or so of the $350 million that were pledged actually appeared. Bill Clinton led two very successful investor missions to uh, Haiti. Uh, security was reestablished through the good work of the UN peacekeeping force. The State Department uh, revised its uh, travel advisory for Haiti and uh, no longer warned Americans not to go there. Uh, Haiti missed the hurricane season. For some reason, there just were no storms this year. Uh, there was a governmental crisis, but it was handled in a very un-Haitian fashion. The parliament voted uh, to, uh, uh, had a vote of no confidence in the, the prime minister. Then almost immediately, a new prime minister was proposed, uh, who happened to be the planning and development minister. He was confirmed, uh, a new cabinet was formed, and a new government took office, all without any ripple. Uh, and so by the time we got to uh, November, December, January, um, Haiti was looking pretty good. And indeed, the week before the hurricane, uh, the PBS NewsHour had a segment on Haiti, and they interviewed a bunch of people, the American ambassador and others, and they all said pretty much the same thing. Haiti had turned a corner. And one really telling interview, they had a fellow whose job was to coordinate investment in Haiti, standing there, um, and he had cell phones in each hand, and he said, literally, I, my phones just keep ringing, people keep calling, they, they want to find out about investment opportunities in Haiti. So Haiti was, was in pretty good shape. Um, and indeed, the two hours before the earthquake hit, we were in a meeting in my office with people from the National Democratic Institute, and we were talking about the elections, the parliamentary elections that were scheduled in Haiti for February 28th, and how we were going to make sure that this all went on. Uh, but there was no doubt that these elections were going to go forward and then it was going to be a big push to take advantage of President Caval's last year in office, uh, a time when a lot of good things were going to happen. So when the quake hit two hours later, this was not only a physical shock and a total surprise, it was a psychological shock and a total surprise. No one was prepared for this. There was truly, in fact, no warning. The quake did many things, and we've heard those described um, graphically, but it did two things that were particularly important uh, in terms of the recovery. It destroyed both of the centers of authority in the country. Uh, it destroyed the Haitian government. The presidential palace, the parliament building uh, were, were destroyed. 13 of the 15 government ministries were destroyed, the police uh, headquarters was heavily damaged. 
And so when the quake was over, uh, we were part of an international effort to actually try to see who was alive. And we were calling people down there to try to find out which of the government ministers had actually survived. The communications went dead, and for a number of days, nobody was quite sure. The government ex has reassembled itself, but the only place that it could find to operate is in a police station on the, on the outskirts of the airport. The building is so badly damaged that UN personnel uh, have permission to politely refuse to go into the building, and so when they meet with Haitian officials, they do it outside because they're afraid the building's gonna fall down. The other thing that happened was that the United Nations headquarters and the UN had been running Haiti pretty much, uh, particularly in the areas of security, since 2004. The UN mission um, was an incredibly effective UN mission for a UN mission, made up of a lot of extremely dedicated and smart people who'd been there for a long time. The UN mission had cracked down on the gangs. It had sort of liberated the country from uh, armed groups that had terrorized the place. And so the UN headquarters was a hub of activity and would have been the place where the recovery effort would have been directed from. The tragedy was that the headquarters collapsed. A hundred of it, hundred people were killed, including the head of the mission, his deputy, the police commissioner. The military commander had been in the meeting, but he had another meeting and he left the building just minutes before everyone was lost. And so this whole leadership cadre was lost. The impact of that, the largest disaster the United Nations has ever suffered, far larger than what happened to the UN with the bombing of UN headquarters in Baghdad in 2003, stunned the United Nations in New York. And the people there, you know, everyone there lost friends, everyone there lost former colleagues. And so it took the international organization time to recoup and to redeploy. And so those people that would have been uh, in charge of the recovery were the people that took the strongest shocks. Normally in these kind of things, I think, you know, the, the disaster occurs in the countryside someplace and the capital stays intact. This is a situation where the most important pieces of the capital were hit the hardest. So, where are we now? The first phase of the recovery effort, which was the search and rescue phase, is over with. Um, I don't know what the number was. It was something like 122 people to 140 people were pulled from the rubble. We're now in the emergency response phase. It looks as if the feeding and the medical part of it are beginning to hit stride, although there are numerous problems. You just look at the, the evening news or read the, the New York Times this morning and you'll see those. Now the focus is on shelter. President Paval has said he needs 200,000 no, 200, tents to house those people that are rendered homeless. There are about 5,000 in the country. There may not be 200,000 tents available in the world. It's a big scramble on right now to see, but shelter is now becoming the most important topic, particularly as Haiti moves in April toward the beginning of the rainy season, you know, and then the, the hurricane season starts in June. We've talked a little bit about governance in Haiti, and I think it's very important to understand President Proval as a leader. He's a very unusual leader for Haiti. As we, you know, Haitian leaders tend to be uh, very dynamic, very charismatic, and very dictatorial. There are uh, people who, uh, like President Aristide, who uh, you know, can rally crowds, but also maybe they have their own views about uh, democracy. President Favala is a very different sort of person. There have only been two presidents in the 200-year history of Haiti who have served their full terms in office and left office voluntarily. And President Preval is one of them. And so he is a unique leader. When he ran for president in 2006, he went back to the hills to his home village of Marmalade and he stayed there until the election was over and he won. And then he came down. He never campaigned. He knew he was the most famous and likely candidate to be elected and he didn't engage. And when he was interviewed recently um, uh, by PBS News on the Lair News Hour, he was asked, uh, no, this was in, it ran there, but he was, the interview was actually a replay when done by the New York Times. The New York Times reporter asked him, why aren't you out there? Why aren't you rallying your people? Why aren't you giving press conferences? And his reaction was, I'm not a politician. I don't do that. I'm a manager. I'm managing the country. 
you know, other people might be out there getting their picture taken, but that's not me. That's not my job. My job is to manage the country. The problem is that there's no public face on the recovery effort, and there is rising popular discontent. As people, as Haitians look for leadership and they look for somebody who can, who can rally the cause. And so what we're getting now is, understandably, manifestations of, of civil unrest. They're also getting acts of desperation. And those, I think, are understandable, and they can be handled. But something new has happened. Yesterday, um, there was an attack on a UN convoy on the road. Kambu was ambushed by 20 armed men. Now, these people weren't terribly serious because when shots were fired, they ran away. But Haiti has a history of gangs. And um, back in 2007, to show you how, 2006, to show you the seriousness of all this, when I went into Haiti in 2006, the UN force commander and I were talking, and he said to me, come on, I'm gonna take you in. So we got in this Jeep, we drove down to Cite Soleil, we got into an armored vehicle, we put on body armor and helmets, a armored, a, an armored personnel carrier, a small tank pulled up beside us, full of Brazilian Marines with their weapons up, and we went into Cite Soleil. And we walked around and uh, with the Brazilian Marines providing a cordon, and uh, you know, they showed us what they were doing, and I had a quintessential Haiti experience. I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend, but uh, the Brazilian Marines walked by a pile of rubble, and they said, this was the police station. And I said, we're gonna rebuild this police station. And I looked at that pile of rubble, and I said, in 1994, I worked for the Department of Justice. We rebuilt that police station. You know, and it went up, and then in the subsequent rioting, and somebody came down again. And now I think it's been rebuilt again. Uh, so, you know, and so we went around, and the Haitian Marines said, you know, we get, uh, the Brazilian Marines said, you know, we get shot at every night. We take harassing fire every night. You know, and then two days later, two Jordanian soldiers were killed right in the spot where we were standing. So, it was a very serious situation. In 2007, the UN went in, and in a series of firefights, defeated the gangs and restored peace to that area. And then when I went back the next time, I walked around in Cite Soleil with a group of American and Haitian NGOs and, and without any armed escorts. So, okay, so Haiti, Haiti has, a, has a criminal gang problem, and that gang problem can come back because one of the things that happened during the earthquake was a major prison in Port-au-Prince uh, didn't exactly collapse. But whatever happened to it, the guards left and then so did all the prisoners. So all of those gang leaders that were rounded up in 2007 are now back on the streets. And so this is a potential problem. Now what has been the U.S. response to this? Well, one of the first things we did is we've sent in the Marines, which is something you've heard we do periodically. Uh, this time it's the 82nd Airborne, a combat brigade with a battalion of Marines. Um, and so in a certain sense, the security situation is under control. Uh, for the moment. The question is, how long can those people stay? Uh, I was on a panel the other day with some military experts and they made the point that, okay, uh, the United States has one combat brigade in reserve. As you know, we have a few other things that are going on in the world where the U.S. Army is, is busy right now. And it's, we have one combat brigade in reserve, or we did. Now that combat brigade is in Haiti. There is no emergency response force anymore. That combat brigade can't stay in Haiti, it has to come out, along with the Marines, uh, along with the engineers, along with the flotilla of ships that are sitting off the coast. And so this is a understandable and, and uh, necessary response, but it's a response that we can't last, they can't sit there forever. The UN has done an incredible job of trying to reconstitute itself, and the UN peacekeeping force has been in the field They've added a 1,500 new personnel, they've brought in new police. But that is a very limited force. It's lightly armed, it has three <coughs> helicopters at its disposal, it's hard to get around in Haiti, as you know, and so that's not really an answer to Haiti's security. The Haitian National Police, which I helped train for the first time in 1994, uh, by 2004, had dwindled down to 2,500 men. You can imagine nine million people with 2,500 cops. The population of New York City is 9 million people. How many people in the NYPD? 40,000. So, I mean, Haitians are 
law-abiding people, but they're not that law-abiding. But you don't need more police. All right, so the UN has rebuilt the police force up to about eight to 9,000 personnel. But most of those pr police were trained in the last year to year and a half. So you have a police force made up of rookie cops. The police force lost somewhere between 300 and 350 personnel, not clear, because a lot of those people just haven't reappeared. But a lot of the Haitian National Police have not come back to duty. And one of the first things that needs to be done is we need, and President Preval has asked the U.S. for this, about 500 tents to create a tent city so that we can create a place for the Haitian National Police and their families to live so that they can be taken care of, so that the police can go out and care for other people. That hasn't happened yet, but that's the kind of first step that has to be undertaken if we're gonna make this work. So the challenge that you've heard about from, from Dean Paxton, the economic challenge, is important, but it is a challenge that must be confronted at the same time we confront another challenge, which is the one of security and the establishment of the rule of law. The Haitian ambassador spoke the other day on a panel that I was on, and he was asking the audience, you know, what is the first thing we have to do? And his response was, we have to reestablish the rule of law. If we don't have a functioning police force, if we don't have a functioning judiciary, if we don't have effective prisons, then we're not going to have security. And if we don't have security, then the rest of this will never happen. We will not be able to go out and do the kind of things that are happening. Um, as you've heard, one of the things that has happened in Haiti following the coup is that people in Port-au-Prince, which had about a third of the population, sometimes Haiti, uh, it's called the Republic of Port-au-Prince because everybody lives there in the capital city. The people who had moved into the capital are moving out, and they're fanning out across the country. I think that's a positive step because it's decentralizing the country. It's also returning people to their roots. But the problem is that these people are going to need assistance too. And what it means is that the, the uh, reef, relief and rehabilitation program has to follow them. And the Prime Minister of Haiti said the other day, our people are leading us, we have to catch up with them. And so while decentralization, as you've heard, is a really good idea in terms of development, and everybody now seems to be pretty much focused on decentralization as a goal of the reconstruction effort, um, we have to catch up. And it's going to be more difficult. Than it, than it might otherwise have been if Port-au-Prince had been intact and we could have operated from there. Okay, so we need to do a few things. In addition to everything else you've heard, obviously, this is a major crisis. We're confronted by all kinds of, of problems. But among, in addition to the, uh, repairing the economy and dealing with the health situation and restoring the education system, we also need to think about restoring the rule of law. And that's going to require the following. It's going to require, first of all, to make sure that the UN stays in place. The UN forces there on the basis of a mandate which was renewed by the UN Security Council every year. It's very important that that mandate be renewed and that those countries which are contributing forces continue to stay in the mix. So that's the first thing. And the second thing that has to be done is that the Haitian National Police, which is currently a kind of interesting force, it was created by the United States in 1994. I had a hand in this. Uh, it looks very much like a metropolitan police force in the United States. And that's because the basic plan was done by a guy who was the deputy chief of the Los Angeles Police Department. There were other parts of the plan, I'm told. Um, if you read this thing I, I gave you, uh, it says that it was modeled after a, an American metropolitan police department. That was at about two minutes before a guy who'd been the chief of police in Savannah, Georgia, called me up and said, no, I was part of that, and you're wrong. He said, we had the New York State Police as our model because we wanted a force that could do not only cities, but it had to do the border, it had to do the ports, it had to fight terrorism, it had to do all these things. And a state police force in the United States can do that. And so we need a new national security force for Haiti, not an army, because that's, that's nasty, <laughs> you can't do that, but a national police force that can do all the things that that is required of a country, and we've not had that in Haiti, so that the United Nations and the United States can go home. The second thing we need to do is we need to do something about courts in Haiti. Courts in Haiti are historically incredibly corrupt. Uh, judges are open to bribes. The court system doesn't function. And so in order to have an effective rule of law, you have to do something about now rebuilding the court system because most of it collapsed, but then you have to train judges. You have to 
reestablish that. There is a legal reform program going on. As far as, there's many things about Haiti which are unique. One thing, the current legal code in Haiti was drafted and has not been changed since 1848, 1864, somewhere around in that, one of those two dates. You know, the legal code dates back to our civil war. And so there, was a, there is a program going on now to revitalize that. That program has to be brought to fruition and then a functioning court system has to be created. And finally, something has to do, somebody has to do something about prisons. Uh, when you all go to work, those of your students, when you go to work for the US government, you'll discover that nobody in the international community does prisons. And the reason for that is that everybody's afraid of human rights abuses. And so in international missions, nobody does prisons, except the New Zealanders. Anyway, and so Haiti has a functioning police program that has some interest in courts, but nobody's working on the prison system. And so a new prison has to be built, not the one that dates from the 1800s that fell apart, but a new one, and then something has to be done with that. The other day, interestingly enough, I called the UN and I said, what are you doing? And the guy said, you know, what we're doing is we're looking for a prison barge the United States government, the United States Navy was out spending two days trying to find a prison barge. And the idea was, since no, there are no functioning prisons anymore, we're going to sail a barge down and anchor it off the coast of Haiti and then use that. We have the U.S. aircraft carrier. Is it the Vincent sitting out there? And that's sort of operating like a, an airport. You know, we have other floating things that are off the coast that are U.S. that are, that are providing assistance. And so we need a floating jail. I don't know, I haven't heard that they found one, but anyway, that's the next thing on the list. Okay, if we were, the international community and Haitians working together, able to create a functioning judicial system, it would have an amazing impact upon public trust in Haiti. One of the big problems with the Haitian situation is that Haitians don't really trust their government and with good reason. There is a legitimacy problem. If we were able to establish the rule of law, that would do as much as anything toward uh, you know, solving that problem. Okay, well anyway, thank you very much and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you. Terrific. Uh, we do have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, if you could come down and line up at the microphone so that uh, people could hear. Yes, come down. Right, right there at the microphone. Yes, my name is Hoffman. I taught at this university for a long time. Uh, it seems to me there are two dimensions that haven't been mentioned in all this discussion. The first one is we all talk about development. We're going to develop the country. We need development. What development? If you read the UN report of 1946 on Haiti, which was uh, requested by President Estimé, you will see that it is almost a hopeless report. It's a very good report, very complete. I'm sure you know it, sir. And uh, the conclusion of the United Nations was the Haitian government should organize rapidly massive emigration of its people, which is, in fact, what happened. About three million people have left Haiti. So there is nothing in the ground in Haiti. There is no oil, there are no minerals, there's nothing to exploit, that's a fact. There is no longer anything on top of the, of the soil. Erosion has ended for all intents and purposes of thing. There is relatively very little education in Haiti, about 70 to 75% are functionally illiterate. What are you going to develop, and what are you going to develop it with? And second, and I'm sorry to take so much time and to be so negative, but I think we have to be clear about what we're doing. The second thing, we talk about the Haitian government as if it was some sort of Western government, like the American, or the French, or the German, or the Swiss government. It isn't. In the history of Haiti, history has been, uh, Haiti has been ruled entirely by about five to 10% of the population who have never in its history done anything 
to develop the country. They have not developed roads, they have not developed schools, anything else. This is again something that we should not forget. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, do you like to take that? Or? Yeah, fine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, there's, there's a great deal of truth in, in what you've just heard. Um, and there are people that have offered other kinds of solutions that a couple of United States senators recently said we ought to have a UN trusteeship for Haiti. There are other things. The trouble with all of this is it's irrelevant um, in the sense that Haiti is, is a fact. It's not going to go away. The people of Haiti are not going to leave the island. Uh, the Haitian government, uh, for good or ill, is going to persevere. The international community is committed. Secretary of State Clinton said the other day, you know, we have been working on Haiti now as a high priority in the Obama administration for a year, which is true. In fact, they were about to come out with their uh, report on their policy review two days before. They had their final meeting two days before the earthquake. We were arranging for someone to come and speak at USIP and lay this out. And she said, you know, they know us and we know them. And so, and we are dedicated to working with them. And so, uh, while, you know, you can point to all the statistics about how terrible it is, it is terrible. But the fact is that the reality is there and we start with the reality we have and we're going to try to work with it. And the reality now, I think, as a result of everything that happened in 2009 is the better reality than we had before. Um, I guess, like, I've actually heard what, you know, the argument that you've said often, and, it's, you know, it's very discouraging just because, you know, there, like, we face many, many problems, but, you know, like, by far, like, I don't know any Haitian who's ready to, like, just give up. And it's not all of Haiti. Um, that's like the picture that you see, there's nothing left. For instance, the town where my mom's family is from, La Vallée de Jacmel, it's right outside of um, Jacmel. It's a town that it's actually been doing pretty well. And one of the reasons was because um, there were, you know, th th in the town, everyone had access to education. Um, there was, um, I think, priests from, I think, Belgium, I forgot, you know, when they came and established there. So now everyone in that town had access to education. So, and then for a high school, a lot of them went to Port au Prince. For example, my grandfather, who turned 100, he, like, his older brother was 102 in that town. And, you know, like, a lot of other people, um, it, it, it's not like all of Haiti is completely deforested. And when you see that town, there are roads. And the roads are, you know, some of the people who have left, um, you know, they have, like, sent money back. And I have uncles that were civil engineers, build roads. Um, you, know, you know, there's, in terms of, like, building solar panels. Like, I went to my grandfather's house. You know, I was like, why is there electricity? You know, like, they, but unfortunately, that's not affordable for everyone yet, you know, but there are maybe future solutions. Um, and also, so, like, if you go to La Vallée de Jacmel, you do see an educated population. There are roads, there's a hospital, and everyone in that town, like, that's one of the towns where you actually see there is a sense of community. So when I see a place like that, you know, I do feel like, you know, that could be replicated in other places, but at the same time, I see the town where my dad's family is from, that's almost the complete opposite, where you have, like, you know, you don't have a good school system, the, you know, most of the population does not have access to potable water, but then, like, people are trying to make differences, like, one of the things, like, and people, you know, I know there's a vast um, Haitian diaspora, I think it's like three to four million, but it's not like we've just left the country and turned back. Like we do send money back. And if a lot of people do intend to return, like hopefully if dual citizenship and other measures, you know, do change, it'll, you know, hasten. But for example, my father, you know, you know, he actually hopes to like start going back to Haiti more often and actually go back. Um, just because, you know, his dream is for the town where his family's from, you know, to actually, you know, build their school or do something. So I feel like there are people who are coming back. It's, you know, it's definitely, we face a lot of challenges, but by no means, like, you know, are we just going to give up and, you know, it just it's going to take time, it's going to take hard work, but, you know, I have faith, so. Great. Terrific. Uh, would you like to ask a question? I admire your spirit. Yes. Uh, my impression, however, coincides with the first questioners. I'm going to give the panel a cross section of what please I give saw. The, please give the panel a question. Yes, yeah. of what I saw in Haiti in 1989. Tell me it's different. 
Yes, you speak of a, uh, a town. Uh, in Haiti, in 1989, I now f know that French, as well as Creole, is a, an acceptable language and an official language. In 1989, only French was an official language. All of the government pronouncements in French could not be understood by the majority of the people in Haiti who didn't speak French. Uh, the water was not utilizable. You either had Culligan water or you used hypochloric acid, and Culligan water was expensive. The NGOs who were there were black marketeers. I didn't need to change at the official rate. They told me, give us your money, and I got stacks of Haitian money this big. Uh, the soil erosion that he talked about was rampant. There are no trees. They've been cut down. There's no terracing. Everything has been done wrong with respect to agriculture. The fishing off the coasts that should be some of the world's richest fisheries, the reef is dead. Could, could I interrupt you for a second? Because I think other people may have questions. And I, well, those you know, are the things. Tell I me it's different. Well, I understand that the country's had a very troubled past. I think it, it would might maybe be wise to go back and read the report that I referred to and that um, Bob referred to that Paul Collier wrote about development opportunities in Haiti. And I found it to be sensible and while not glowingly optimistic, I think it really stressed some of the strengths uh, in terms of good access to U.S. markets, which if it could be exploited, the country could do better. So I, 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 I think it's very easy to go and look around and say this place looks awful, but I, I think there are, there are some real strengths there that this could be an opportunity to try to um, exploit. I think we have time for one more question. Yes, uh, two quick questions. Uh, Mr. Prito, you mentioned that prior to the earthquake, there was some optimism in terms of uh, international or foreign countries, foreign companies investing. Right. You, can you name any like American companies and what kind of industries that they were thinking of investing in? Yeah. And the other question had to do with the uh, possible misappropriation of funds or aid that I think uh, Professor Khan had talked about, alluded to. Can you, is that responsible for, is the responsibility that from the, uh, the current administration down in Haiti, or can you expand on what what transpired there with the uh, misappropriation of, uh, of aid? I, I don't recall talking about the misappropriation well, of Maybe that's funds. not the term used, but you said that there's been some difficulty. Effort, effort there was difficulty used. getting, you know, support, yeah. just, just getting the materials needed. But there's no evidence of... If, if there is, I'm not aware of it. I'll, I'll just wait for your... Okay. Yeah, on to take... The problem of corruption in Haiti is well known. About two years ago, Haiti was number one uh, on the list of the of Transparency International's most corrupt countries. So it's down to around five or six now. But but Haiti does have a, a problem with official corruption, and it, and it manifests itself in in a kind of difficult way that will be probably exacerbated by the current situation. And that is that uh, Haiti is often called the Republic of NGOs. There are about six thousand NGOs that work in the country. All of the uh, services that you would expect to be provided by the government in Haiti are almost all provided by non-governmental organizations. The United States puts all of its $400 million worth of assistance uh, to Haiti every year through non-governmental organizations. And what this does is it gets the government. Uh, people who have talent don't work for the government because they can get better jobs with NGOs. And so th the government itself doesn't really function. Um, we've heard that from other speakers. And so one of the things that has to happen now is that there has to be a program of almost forcing money through the government, through the government budget, and then monitoring that, that money to make sure that, first of all, those people that have these responsibilities in the government are trained to do their jobs and that they do them. So that's, that's a big part of this. And the other piece of the question dealt with what? Private investment. Pri private investment. Oh, yeah. Just to give you three quick, uh, th three, three quick examples. Uh, the HOPE legislation that you've heard provides uh, in trade incentives for garment manufacturers in Haiti. They can use materials that come from China that are very cheap, manufacture them, 
into garments and sell them in the United States duty free. This is a terrific opportunity and it's available to the Haitians until 2018. Uh, this had generated about 28,000 new jobs uh, in the period of the last few months uh, and it was beginning to, to pick up speed. Haynes is a, a company that has a, a fairly modern plant that manufactures underwear, for example. That's one. Secondly, um, a couple of major hotel chains uh, had built hotels and were planning to move back into Haiti. Haiti used to be a place in the Caribbean where people went on vacations. That's why the Clintons went there in 72. Um, Comfort, Comfort Inns, I think, whoever owns Comfort Inns had built a hotel. And then the, you heard the, uh, one of the major shipping lines that brings, um, that does Caribbean cruises had built a major pier in the northern part of the country and it actually started stopping off there. And, and as you heard, it actually started to tell the people on the cruise, this is Haiti, you know, it's not Hispaniola, but it's still safe to go ashore. Haiti has beautiful beaches. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of possibility there. And the town of Jacmel, which you heard referred yeah. to, looks like New Orleans, or it did. Yeah. 